Welcome to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. We wish you could attend in person, but trust that God will bless you through the music and the study of His Word. Thank you for joining us. In our last study, we noticed that God's good gift to believers is the Holy Spirit. He helps us to understand the Bible, guides our consciences, gives us, to strength, gives us strength to live as God's people in righteousness and holiness. And he's present with us as we live our daily lives. The casting out of demons was one of the signs of the kingdom. We know that Jesus taught and he did miraculous signs by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we begin with the source of Jesus' power being called into question. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Notice that there were three reactions to this casting out of this demon. The first reaction was that the people marveled. Now, marveling is a good thing. 
It's that initial amazement that makes us stop and think, what's going on here? But when Jesus was doing miracles, the purpose was that they would stop and think, this must be the Son of God. This must be the coming Christ or Messiah. This must be the beginning of his kingdom. If they didn't go beyond that amazement to following Jesus and joining his kingdom, then their amazement served no purpose. Sometimes God does signs in our lives. We may have a miraculous escape from a near accident on the highway. Or God may use modern medicine to keep us alive. Or God may supply our practical needs in a miraculous way. And we're amazed. We marvel at what God has done for us. But too often we don't stop to think, why? Why did God do that for us? And we walk away and forget about the sign that we've received from God. And it serves no purpose in our lives. Some of the people thought it was miraculous, but put it down to the power of Beelzebul. Beelzebul is used here as another name for Satan. They were accusing Jesus of being in league with Satan. Whenever we see something that seems supernatural, it falls into one of three categories. It may be natural, not supernatural. I remember in high school pouring lead nitrate solution into potassium iodide solution. Both are clear liquids, but when poured together, the result is a bright yellow precipitate. That's natural, even though it looks like a miracle. Fake healings aren't supernatural either. I was once told of a woman confined to a wheelchair after a car accident until her insurance settlement came through, and then she claimed that God miraculously healed her. Or it may be from Satan. In other words, it may be supernatural, but not from the power of God. In Luke chapter 8, verse 29, we learned about a demonized man who was so strong that he could break chains and shackles. That wasn't natural. And it wasn't God's power. And of course, it may be from God. In other words, it may have come about through God's power. Like all the healings that we've been reading about in Luke's Gospel. I heard of a case that happened many years ago in the far north. Many people in this community had turned to Christ. They wanted to sing praises to God, but none of them could play music. One man picked up an accordion, prayed for God's help, and could suddenly pray, play hymns. Notice that these people didn't accuse Jesus of having faked a healing. They understood that a demon really had been cast out of the man. Instead, they attributed Jesus' power to Satan. They accused Jesus of working with Satan. This is a serious accusation. If they were right, then they could dismiss his teaching, since they wouldn't want to pay attention to God's enemy. And they could also feel justified when they shouted out to Pilate to crucify him. And I'm sure that some of these people did just that. There are Christians who believe that all signs and wonders ended at the time of the apostles. Logically, that means that all apparent signs and wonders now are either fake or from Satan. It's a serious accusation, and I believe it's going too far. If there is even one sign or wonder done by the power of the Holy Spirit, it would be wrong to falsely describe it as fake or demonic. On the other hand, it's very serious for a preacher to claim that an apparent miracle is done by the Holy Spirit, unless it is. When something that seems miraculous is happening, we need discernment. We dare not naively assume that everything apparently supernatural comes from God, nor should we dismiss it out of hand. We use scripture to help us discern what's really happening and by whose power. Notice that the third group were questioning or testing Jesus about that very thing. They were demanding that Jesus prove who he claimed to be, the Son of God and the Christ, 
and prove that he wasn't in league with the devil by giving them a sign from heaven. Now we might think that they were practicing discernment. Not so. Their attitude was wrong. They were testing Jesus. If they'd wanted to believe Jesus, if they were really seeking a sign from heaven, they would have believed the signs that Jesus had been doing already. Wherever he went, he had healed people and cast out demons. These were two signs that he did regularly, as we've seen. And not only did Jesus do those signs, he sent out the 12 and then the 72 to do the same. So the group that was testing him had already been given many signs from heaven. And so had the group that accused him of being in league with Satan. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Jesus pointed out, quite logically, that it made no sense to suggest that the demons were being thrown out by the power of the prince of demons. Satan would not be fighting against himself. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus reminded them that some of their sons were casting out demons. Now this morning I'm not going to discuss the question of how these men were casting out demons, nor about their success rate. But Jesus was asking them if they would accuse their own sons of casting out demons by Beelzebub. If not, then they shouldn't be accusing Jesus of casting out demons by satanic power. The people who had watched Jesus cast out the demons knew that he wasn't faking it. And Jesus had given two reasons why it made no sense to accuse him of doing it by the power of Satan. The logical conclusion was that Jesus was casting out demons by the finger or the power of God. And since that was the case, then the kingdom of God had come upon them. And then Jesus gave them a verbal picture to help them understand what was really going on behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, it was Jesus against Satan. Behind the scenes, it was the kingdom of God against the kingdom of Satan. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. In Jesus' picture, the strong man wearing armor represents Satan. He had the power to protect what he had until a stronger man came along. And Jesus is the stronger man. Jesus was attacking Satan, overcoming Satan, pulling off his armor. In Matthew 12, 29, Jesus was binding the strong man. In other words, Jesus has the power to make Satan weak and vulnerable. In Jesus' picture, the spoil are the people that he had under his control before Jesus came and released them. Last August, I preached a sermon called, Is Not This Joseph's Son? That sermon included Luke 4.18, where Jesus said that one of his ministries was to bring liberty to the captives. And I commented that Jesus came to free people from the captivity of sin. Now looking back from the point of view of this chapter, I think that Jesus was also referring to freeing people from the captivity of demons. Wherever Jesus went, he cast out demons. And when he sent out the 12 and the 72, they also cast out demons. So if I'm right about Luke 4, when Jesus and the disciples were casting out demons, they were bringing liberty to captives as signs of his kingdom. 
And when Jesus cast out this mute demon, it was one more sign of his kingdom. Let's remember this when we need encouragement. When we're part of Jesus' kingdom, we are on the winning side. Jesus is stronger than Satan. We don't need to fear even demonic forces. We've been set free from their power and the power of sin in our lives. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Once again, Jesus pointed out that there are only two sides. Whether they realized it or not, those who were not with Jesus were against him. Those who were not helping him gather the harvest were scattering it. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. There's an epidemic of illicit drug use across our country, and even here in Peterborough. And bad as that is, the fact that some of those drugs are contaminated with more potent drugs has led to many deaths. Now, occasionally we will hear of someone who has been successfully rehabilitated from dependency on drugs. And I'm sure we're all aware that it's not sufficient just to get the person off the drugs. He or she has to fill up that place in their lives with something else. Those who don't learn to live productive lives by committing their lives to serving Jesus or finding some other way to contribute to society, they will soon begin using again. And soon they'll be taking more drugs than they were before. Now by comparison, a demon is much worse. And when Jesus cast out a demon, that man had to allow God to fill his life. Most of us probably have never dealt with demonic powers in our own lives, but we have dealt with the power of sin. Whatever it is that we have repented of must be replaced. Evil spirits must be replaced by the Holy Spirit. Evil thoughts and evil deeds must be replaced by truth and deeds of kindness. Intoxication by drugs must be replaced by rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. And by His Holy Spirit, God will fill our lives. As He said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to Him, Blessed is the woman that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But He said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now technically the woman was right. Jesus' mother was blessed to have born Jesus and cared for him as a baby. There's a very close connection between a mother and her child. Mary would have the blessing of remembering the details of Jesus' life from the time when angel, the angel Gabriel first spoke to her until Jesus began his ministry. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 42, Mary's cousin Elizabeth declared Mary to be blessed among women. So why didn't Jesus simply answer, you're right? In one sense, this woman was giving praise to Jesus. In our day, we might say to a successful person, your mother must be proud of how you've turned out. This woman, I believe, was saying something similar. You're so wonderful, your mother's blessed to have given birth to you and nursed you. And yet I think she was also praising Jesus' mother. How many times do we read or hear a Christian biography that begins with a comment about how a certain famous Christian had a praying, godly mother? And you and I owe much to our parents. And it may be appropriate to praise a mother or a father for an ordinary child when they become a godly man or a godly woman. But Jesus never was ordinary. He was never sinful. He didn't have to be taught how to behave. If this woman was giving Mary credit for how wonderful a person Jesus became, then she was wrong. 
And so Jesus replied to the woman by undercutting any praise that she might be offering to Mary. What was really praiseworthy is hearing and obeying God's words. Now this seems that Jesus was implying that Mary didn't always hear God's word and keep it. And we do know that she wasn't perfect. At the time of the wedding in Cana, which we read about in John 2, Jesus rebuked her when she asked him to supply wine for the feast. So Mary was not a perfect person. She was not without sin. However, I don't think that was Jesus' point. In fact, we could take Mary as an example of one who did hear God's word when the angel Gabriel spoke to her. And she did obey. She bore God's son, giving birth to him, cared for him. But we must never elevate Mary to a demigoddess. We must never pray to her. On the contrary, according to Philippians 4, 6, we're to bring our requests to God. And according to John 14, 14, we do so in Jesus' name, not in the name of Mary or any other person, no matter how godly they were. Mary was blessed for hearing and obeying God. But rather than leaving the focus on Mary, Jesus said that anyone who hears and obeys God obeys God, is blessed. After this interlude with the woman who praised Mary, Luke continued with the signs of the kingdom. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Jesus was disappointed with the crowd. When he said this, he was talking about his own generation, about the people among whom he walked. They were seeking for a sign, but they were evil. The sick were being raised, and the gospel of the kingdom was being preached, but they wanted something more. They probably wanted something spectacular, like a military victory against the Roman Empire. But God wasn't going to give them more signs, except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. What was Jesus referring to when he described Jonah as a sign to the people of Nineveh? Have you ever wondered why the people believed him? Nineveh was far from the sea, so the people wouldn't have heard about how a fish rescued him from drowning. I cannot prove this, but to me, if Jonah himself was the sign, then he must have looked like a sign. For a time, he would smell like he'd been inside of a fish, but I think the digestive juices of the fish would have shriveled and scarred his skin. And I've no doubt for a long time, maybe the rest of his life, he looked like death, like a man who'd been in a fish. Jesus would become a sign too. The fact that he was seen alive at all after the resurrection was a sign. But he also had the marks of death on him, in his hands and his feet. And he showed the disciples the wound in his side. Luke didn't mention this, but there is another parallel between Jonah and Jesus. Jonah had been three days in the fish. He was as good as dead but the fish vomited him back onto land. Jesus was three days in the tomb. He was dead, but Jesus arose alive from the tomb. These were the signs of the prophet Jonah, signs that Jesus applied to himself. And he continued, The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. In 1 Kings chapter 10, we read about the Queen of Sheba, described here as the Queen of the South. She'd heard of Solomon's wisdom in the name of the Lord, and she came from far away to test his wisdom. His wisdom had been graciously given to him by God. Behold, Jesus continued, something greater than Solomon is here. Solomon's kingdom was a great earthly kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Solomon was a great man. Jesus 
is the Son of God himself. Solomon was wise. Jesus was the wisdom of God in person. At the judgment, the Queen of Sheba would condemn that generation because she'd come a long distance to hear from the great Solomon. While they refused to hear Jesus, who was right in their midst and who was greater than Solomon. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Returning to the subject of Jonah, Jesus said that the people of Nineveh would condemn that generation at the judgment. Well, why? Because the Ninevites had repented at the preaching of Jonah. And yet that generation refused to repent at the preaching of Jesus himself. Jonah was a prophet, but Jesus is the Son of God. As we close this morning, let's add to these comparisons. Solomon was a king, a great and wise king. Jesus is the one greater than the great King Solomon. He is the king of the kingdom of God. From him we learn greater wisdom. Jonah preached that Nineveh would be destroyed for its wickedness, and the people of Nineveh repented and were saved from destruction. Jesus is the one greater than Jonah, who preached repentance from sin. Those who repent are saved from sin, and they're saved from perishing in hell. Since Jesus is greater than Jonah, and greater than Solomon, his hearers must not ignore him. Do you remember our study in the letter of Hebrews? Hebrews begins by showing that Jesus is greater than all who came before him, greater even than the angels. And so Hebrews makes the point that we must not ignore Jesus. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no getting around this verse. We dare not ignore Jesus. Each of us this morning falls into one of two categories. Either we have repented and been given life through believing in Jesus, who is the truth, or we haven't repented, we don't believe in Jesus, and we're still dead in our sins. Again this morning we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Jesus said that we should take this opportunity to remember and proclaim. We remember and proclaim each time we eat and drink that Jesus died on the cross so that we could live and become part of the heavenly kingdom. So the Lord's Supper is not for the unrepentant, it's not for unbelievers, and it's not for those who are still dead in their sins. We don't know your heart, but God does. And if you want to repent and believe, then imagine yourself at the foot of the cross. In your heart, cry out to God, asking for forgiveness in the name of Jesus, and he will welcome you. If you want to learn more, please feel free to speak to me or to me after the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Our Father, you know the hearts of each one of us. We pray for repentant hearts, for believing hearts. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me me
his cleansing power revealing how we made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about a mansion built for me in glory and i heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing This is Pastor David Richardson again. Thank you for listening to this YouTube version of our Sunday service. We would be delighted to have you join our Sunday services in person. The sermons are live versions of what you've just heard, usually verse by verse teaching from the Bible. Our live worship is much more dynamic in person. It is thoughtfully and prayerfully planned and led by our worship leader, Sylvie Copland, with the help of our praise team. Please consider this your invitation to join us, if you are able. Thank you.